Um, and let's continue with what we were doing uh, last time, which means with uh, Walid Ra'ad. I remind you that last time we, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, colonizing and decolonizing Ra'ad, meaning uh, you can read the works of Ra'ad by inscribing them in the uh, universal uh, history of the arts. And I think by that you missed a very, very uh, fundamental component, which is his uh, position in the uh, uh, Lebanese political and historical scene. And I think that really his work is addressing that uh, mainly, at least the Atlas group is really addressing uh, the Lebanese wars. And also addressing the way he lived through that, and the way he lived through that as an apprentice photo uh, journalist. You know, when he was a kid, when he was uh, 14, 15, a teenager, he used to carry his cameras around his neck, which was uh, thinner than a hair, a uh, very thin neck, and he used to go really and take pictures of uh, what was going on. And he recalls how he used to be interrogated, arrested, how they used to check his uh, camera, because uh, until today, uh, you know, it's a scene, it's an environment which is highly mi militarized, or at least people are paranoid when you have a photographer uh, roaming around. You can try it in Solidaire and in Dahir, and in actually many places. You just take your camera, and someone comes and tells you, what are you taking here? What are you doing here? And uh, so he really lived through that. And he reflected on how can you make photographies in this environment? Uh, what are the conditions to do that, etc. OK? So in the colonial reading, I hope by now it's clear that you correlate uh, his work as a visual sens senses, uh, sensitive given to some meaning, which is usually humanity, universality, uh, interiority, all of these, you know, bubbles that you can interpret the works with. And Rad's reply is always, well, no. You see, if I'm doing a blue monochrome with this little image, it's not because blue is the symbol of peace, but it's because I was a migrant, I was an immigrant, and my mom used to call me, I have these two images together. If I do this kind of monochromes, it's not because I'm, I'm in a dialogue necessarily with the history of the monochrome, Roscoe, I don't know, Rochenko, and all of these people. It's not that. It's because in, uh, the, in the place in which I used to take photos, monochromes, well, you know, you have the sea, the sky, and uh, destroyed buildings. So gray, blue, and dark blue. And the sea is filled with uh, dead people because of the immigration. The sky is encrypted with possible invasions from the Israeli uh, airplanes. And the uh, gray surfaces that we really witnessed, uh, you know, after a bombardment, everyone is gray. I don't know if you have seen these pictures, but you are, everything is gray. Uh, so actually, you need to see that beneath these monochromes, there are, uh, there's death, uh, uh, destruction, cadavers, and the like. And this is why, actually, he replays that in his monochromes, uh, by telling you his little story. We found these under a destroyed building. We sent them to France, and they were able to bring from beneath the blue or gray color uh, people, groups of people. And this replaced that. So in a way, it's an image about the real. Uh, it's an, about encode. It's really an attempt to take a picture of what is really going on, or to think, how can I make a picture of what is going on, and not just you know like indexical images, as he calls them. You know, indexical images is the images that he criticizes. It's like the images that, that are taken by the photojournalists, be it CNN, TF1, or the like, where you have these photojournalists that come to Lebanon, and they just take, you know, uh, someone killing, uh, bombarded homes, cadavers, misery, or uh, uh, massacres. And he's really critical about that. I hope this is clear. Uh, I hope you watch the movies Or La Vie and Schlondorf's uh, uh, 
circle of uh, this site, uh, of this site. Deceit, yeah. So I hope you've watched it. Uh, so uh, you see in that movie, how really this typical for the journalist who takes indexical photo. In Orlavi, in the beginning of the movie, you have this photojournalist, the French guy who takes pictures, help people, and then who is blindfolded after his camera roll is burned. Now, Walid Rad is critical about that. Why is he critical about that? As I told you already, because this doesn't really first capture the complexity of that situation. This is number one. And second, it's because these photo, indexical photojournalistic pictures, at the end they contribute to build a fiction on Lebanon, a fiction on Lebanon, while Walid Raid considers that you have something real, in quote, real and very complex, and you have the delirium on that reality. And you see that the whole point is to play on the tension between these two things. I'll explain that uh, now. So to understand really what Walid Raad is doing, uh, you know that if you, if you, I hope you will check his site. Uh, you have the link. It's atlasgroup.org, where you have all the works. Yeah. I think he uses fiction to expand the uh, Exactly. So we need to see, is he using fiction? What is fiction? And to some extent, what is reality? Because if you read many of the colonial readings of Rad, is that, you know what, he plays on fiction and reality. So when he tells you that this guy exists, actually he doesn't really exist. And uh, that's it. OK, so we need to understand exactly what is fiction. And is really what he's right playing on fiction and reality, as many, many, many people say. One thing is for sure is that Walid Raad himself, in presenting his works in Ashkel and Alwan, in the, in the bibliography, he says, me, I really don't care about fiction and reality. OK, at least it's clearly stated. In the interviews, too, that you have fragments of them, he really says, it's really not my, uh, my, I'm really not preoccupied with this binary fiction reality or actually present and fictionalized and all of these things. Oh, I need to understand why. To understand that, I think, I really think, but this is here a bit my reading, that Walid Rad operates in what you call the age of data the age of uh, data, you know, uh, big data, computers, internet. So the age of uh, information uh, in its two phases. He really addressed the TV phase, the television information system, with many works, like the works that you have seen, Bashar tapes and the like. And he addressed the data era, meaning the internet and uh, the cyber uh, space in uh, subsequent works. Now, what is the character of this age? The character of this age, or how can we characterize the data or the information age? It is an age where there is a kind of propensity, there is a kind of will to reduce the whole world to an information system. You know, if you go to Paris, the metro is guided by, info, by a computer. Uh, you know, today you have what you call a metro without a driver, or you have also drones, drones which are air, airplanes without drivers, and you have all kinds of uh, telecommunication system, military system, economic system, and the like, that don't need anymore a kind of human intervention, but this is not the main point. The main point is that today, with computers, you can literally transform the world into a machine or into a computing machine. What does it mean? It means that if you are driving your car, uh, it turns red, then green. This, this is computation. And you, you're part of this information system. You drive when they tell you to drive. You stop when they tell you to stop. And then your phone tells you where is your favorite pizza shop. So you go there. You eat your favorite pizza. And then you have your favorite date. You go, you sit on a date, and then you go back home, and you do all what your phone is telling you to do. This is what you call the information era. I hope it's clear what I'm saying. 
This is was theorized by Deleuze and many others. Uh, Deleuze, uh, uh, Gattari, uh, Virilio, and many, many thinkers. And what are they saying? They're saying that today in Europe, uh, in the West, uh, in the developed countries, uh, call it the way you want, in the developed countries, they have the means to transform the world into an information system. They have the means, meaning they have like uh, cable systems, computers, engineers, and administration, electricity. electricity. So they have the means to transform the world into a viable information system. They have statistics, etc., etc. So when you do that, the what you call the programming is being able to apply on the visual world as such. And you have here, uh, for those who did Deleuze, you have here a kind of membrane, meaning the brainy stuff, you see it in front of you. Uh, when you see a highway, if you want to picture Paris or New York as a computer system, you see cars moving in sync, and then they stop, they move left, right, all the lights, everything is synced with these information things. And of course, these systems are connected together. The economical information system dictates how people consume, which informs uh, advertisement, which informs television, which informs the internet. And all of that makes you captured in this mega grid, which is the information system. I hope this is clear. I don't know if you have watched this movie called Dr. Strangelove. Did you watch Dr. by Kubrick? Yes. Yeah, so Kubrick is the author of the information system because he shows you that actually everything is an information system. And in the movie Kubrick, Dr. Strangelove, I hope you'll watch it, it's on the list. Uh, you see how uh, the atomic bombs are all connected via a computer, and there's a procedure to uh, trigger the atomic bomb. So you have a very, very strict procedure pertaining to when you can launch an atomic bomb. And in the movie, you, you see that at one point, one of the links, a general, he cracks because he has a crisis with his girlfriend, so he cracks, and he sends an airplane to bomb Russia, like that. To do that, so you have a crack in the system, and the airplane goes to bomb Russia, and uh, due to the information system, after a while, you can't stop the airplane anymore. And the Russians have another information system which, which says that if Russia is bombed, automatically, without human intervention, they start bombing everyone else. And here you see how this information system is like a causal web, where if you have a tiny mistake, it's a disaster. Um, it's a disaster, and indeed in the movie, I hope you'll watch the movie because you see a big screen. I'm telling you that because if you look at the screens of Olid Rad, they look the same. You have a huge screen like that that shows you how the airplane is going towards Russia, and the airplane throwing the bomb, and then you see how the, the Russians are throwing bombs, and how now the automated and the automated nuclear system of the American is throwing bombs again, and it's like the apocalypse, it's the destruction of the world, and they are negotiating, uh, you know, how to go and hide themselves, you know, the president and the, his staff. And this is how the movie ends, okay? I, ho I hope you're getting what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if you are in the West, I mean, if you are in a developed country, your life is really like configured by an information system, more than you can imagine. Advertisement is part of the information system. So when you want, want to buy your uh, Nike pair of shoes, actually you are brainwashed in advance. If you want to eat in that restaurant, it's the same. If you want to buy this shampoo, it's the same. Uh, this is why Deleuze calls these societies controlled societies because we're able now to manage and orient people by controlling, in quotes, their minds. You know, I tell you, this is a good uh, thing to buy, you buy it, uh, and you go here, you go there, and you have this kind of control of the mass from these information systems. You know, the first system of control was television and advertisement, and you have the second system of control, which is uh, the internet and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, iPhones and the like, where you have a personalized control. 
radio is before, it was heavily used by the fascists and the Nazis, and not only, but there are those who really like invested in the radio. You know that Hitler used to, uh, be, he was able to control Germany via the radio. He was one of the first to use this medium. And he had a very, very viral voice. You know, he had a very voice uh, which is like, uh, you go crazy when you listen to him uh, a lot. Um, it's another control system, yeah. So you have radio, TV, and then internet, which are the three phases. But Walil Rad only deals with television and with uh, uh, internet. Okay. So I hope you got the idea. Now, if you take uh, artists from the developed countries, you have Kubrick. Now, Kubrick, what does he show you? He shows you that however is, or you can try to control the system as much as you want, there will be cracks for sure. Uh, which means it doesn't matter how much you sophisticate your uh, communication system, there are going to be cracks. And if there is a crack, it's a disaster because the bigger the, bigger the information system and the bigger, the bigger is the disaster. I hope you're getting the idea. For example, Herzog in a movie on the internet, he says that today everything is connected and dependent on the internet on, and on the optical cables. And the optical cables are very, very sensitive to solar flare, to the solar tempest, you know, the solar uh, hurricanes. So if there is a huge tempest on the sun, these cables will burn, and if they burn, you will fall into chaos. Uh, actually, they burned in 1854. The cables of the telegraph burned, and the, the optical cables are much more sensitive to the solar flare. So if you have a solar tempest soon, the internet will shut down, and you have chaos all around the globe. Okay. So here, I'm, I'm just explaining to you this kind of relation in the developed countries between creating a kind of mega information system in which you live. And this mega information system is or has a kind of propensity or is vulnerable to accident. And if you take Kubrick or uh, Alain René or Antonioni, they really deal with that. Uh, and why you will have accidents? You will have accidents because, you know, his girlfriend left him, uh, literally. Uh, if you take Alain René, Alain René shows you in a movie called Monogue d'Amérique, he shows you that human beings are very developed, but they still have uh, the brain of a rat inside them. Meaning that in your emotional brain is very, very rudimentary. It's the brain that deals with your emotion, girlfriend, boyfriend, with your aggressivity, and all of these things. This is managed by the primitive brain, or what you call the reptilian brain. On the other hand, you have a developed brain which deals with science, philosophy, and stuff like that, art, aesthetics, whatever you want. And this brain is really open to the universe and is able to create all of these information systems, the conquest of space and the like. But when you put together these two brains, well, you have a kind of uh, latent bomb. Why you have a latent bomb? Because uh, if your girlfriend leaves you, you throw an atomic bomb on uh, the Russians, and it's a disaster, OK? So this is, if you want, the critique in the, in the West or in the advanced uh, countries. Now, in reaction to that, uh, in reaction to that, because these capitalist information systems, uh, opening markets, connecting people, making them consume, everything becomes marketable or everything becomes something that you can sell and buy. Now, this creates two things in this part of the globe. Uh, what does it create here? So, so you, you are, let's say, a, a, an industrialized country, and you are very powerful and very organized, like the States, France, and stuff like that. You have a problem, which is you need to export your goods, and you need to put your hand on raw materials. You know the story. You have to, you need oil and petroleum stuff, or cotton, or uh, whatever you need. And these things are usually in the third world. And you, when you manufacture, you need to export your stuff to the third world. So you need to establish a kind of relation of dependency of the third world on you. Why you need to establish this relation? Because you want to get their raw materials, and you don't want them to manufacture their raw materials. And when you do the manufacturing, you want to sell a part of it to them. 
Yeah. As you know, in Lebanon, uh, Lebanon produces tobacco, but is not allowed to make cigarettes. Uh, I think this was still on till very recently, if it's not still on. So the Lebanese have the right to produce tobacco. They sell it to the French regime. The French regime was still functioning until, I think, today. And the French regime manufactures the cigarettes. They used to do it in France. And then they sell you the cigarettes that come from France. Okay? Uh, see, there's only our manufacturer here, but usually all the rest are manufactured somewhere else, and they sell you these things. In the good old days, they used to really manufacture them in France and sell you the cigarettes. So you lose on both transactions. Um, whatever is the story, this is what you call uh, the division of labor when it comes to countries. That in Lebanon, you can only do tobacco. Egypt, you can only do cotton. We do the manufacturing, we sell you the stuff. Now, in order to establish that, you need to make a deal inside these underdeveloped countries with some people that are going to back you up. And indeed, in Lebanon, as I told you last time, the deal was made with first the rich, uh, usually some Sunni families and mostly of the Christian families during the colonial days. So you had a structure where the French colonial powers are making a deal with the rich families most of them are from Beirut, so you had Christian, Sunni, Orthodox, but the majorities are a Christian kind of uh, coming from a Christian milieu. And this was the deal. Now, these are supposed now to govern the population, which is majorit uh, majoritarianly either poor Christian uh, or the uh, other uh, confessions. So you have this kind of structure. Uh, now, this structure is what you call a sectarian structure because you have on one side, a highly industrialized aspect of the society is there. And on the other side, you need to keep the society in dependence. I'll give you another example. Take Saudi Arabia, at least it's more clear. Al Saud, OK, they're a family. They made a deal with the British. And the British told them, OK, you rule, you and your family. You rule, and actually, his family is still ruling until today, meaning. Uh, his direct sons via the brothers that inherit the throne. And in exchange to that, the British and American companies can exploit the oil. So what do you end up having? You end up having a very, very archaic governmental system, which is either grounded on confessions like in Lebanon, or grounded on families and Sharia like in Saudi Arabia. This allows to block the political governance, the political game. It allows to keep things where they are. But on the other side, you have something very developed, like the petroleum industry in, the Saudi, in, the, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, which is really like very, very advanced. One of the most advanced chemical industries in the world is in Saudi Arabia. So you have this on one hand. On the other hand, you have a very, very archaic system of governance. You put them together, and you have another form of explosive situation. It's like the reptilian brain and the advanced brain, but here it's different. You have a very, very archaic system of governance coupled with a very, very advanced system of production services or other. In Lebanon, the advanced system was the service sector, meaning banking, hotels, and these things, because the banks in Lebanon were supposed to manage the money of the Gulf. Because back then, you didn't have banks in the Gulf. And the money used to come here. And the Lebanese were supposed to manage the money of the Gulf. And Lebanon, because it has a nice weather and you know uh, nice people and stuff like that, so the hotelry and the fun stuff were here. Uh, so here you had a base. Actually, Aramco's base, I don't know if you know that, was in Hamra Street. This is why you have a UB here and all of the American school around uh, Hamra. Huh? Yeah, the headquarters of Aramco, actually even the, the, the houses of Aramco used to be here. And they used to take the airplane to Saudi Arabia. So here it was really like the managing quarter of the oil, oil industries which are in Saudi Arabia. And you still have parts of it. If you walk in Hamra, you see Aramco, stuff like that, if you notice the things. You have still the Aramco building. It's the Medina, Masih al-Medina building. OK, so you have still these traces. And actually, the streets, uh, you know, from uh, Red Shoe left, you had the camp of Aramco there. And then you go down, you have the American school, which is the IC. It became the IC. And then you have the American University. And this was the American, if you want, uh, uh, headquarter. 
And I, I'm, I'm telling you all of that because, of course, in Lebanon, you had a colonial side with Place de l'Etoile, et cetera, allied with the confessional re leaders, which are the big families, be it Christian or, uh, uh, you know, the Ektaji families. And you have this membrane. Okay, I hope this is clear. Now, why I'm telling you all of that, telling you all of that to understand really what, uh, is, is, what do you do in this kind of context? Uh, what do you do in this kind of context is that on one hand, you have the power of fictual, fictually, fictionalization, if you can call it that, the power of producing fictions by the first world. And here, really, you need power. You need to have journalists on the grounds. You need to have Hollywood. You need to have like big production houses to be able to produce the fiction. Now, what is a fiction? Like Godard says, fiction is what we believe is reality. So it's never opposed to reality, fiction. What you need to understand, and this aesthetics, fiction is what we believe is reality. For example, when you have Rambo or when you have John Ford making movies on Indians or on Vietnamese, people in America, if you take the average American, they believe that you know the Indians are uh, more or less uh, stupid, the Arabs are also stupid, etc., etc. So you have this kind of stigmatization and stereotypization that you have seen already. But to do that, you need to produce fiction. And to produce the fiction, you need big production houses that will make you believe that it is like that. OK? I hope this is clear. So when you have photojournalists coming here, like in the movie of Schlondorf, taking pictures of a guy shooting another guy with the head title Savage Wars in Lebanon, what do you understand immediately? That these people are savages. They don't, uh, they don't, uh, you know, they don't care about women, children, peace, humanity, or whatever. And this, as we have seen in Rad, this allows the intervention. This allows to send the American troops, of course, not only to save the poor children, etc., but to protect whatever they have here in terms of interest, uh, banking systems, or whatever. And this is how fiction is actually part and a constituent part of a type of reality. Okay? So the indexical image allows you to fuel in the fiction. Uh, you know, like, if you take pictures or if you make movies around the 30s, 20s, uh, in the States about how Indians are savages and after all, maybe we were right to kill them and to conquer the land. You, brain, you brainwash, you wash your consciousness and you say, after all, it's, we did a good thing, you know? We did a good thing in, in uh, colonizing uh, North America. Okay, it's the same story again and again. You, bring, you send here the photojournalists, they take pictures of these savages, massacres, and I don't know what, and you put this uh, in the news, and this becomes the reality. It's very simple. So fiction is that. Fiction, you need to have the power to produce a stereotype that will become hegemonic, that will achieve hegemony, Meaning, each time now you think of an Arab, you think that he's a terrorist. And each time you think of a you know, Mexican, you think he's a rapist. And this is how fiction works. OK. So of course, the question is, what do you do in this situation? You, which is, who, you who doesn't have the power of the fiction, I mean, you can't really achieve hegemony and who are most of the time the one who is stigmatized by the power of the fiction. Right. You are usually the Arabs, the Indians, the Vietnamese, who, are, who is being portrayed like that by the Western media, movies, uh, books, uh, photojournalists, and the like. So what can you do against that? And I think this is where Walid Zrad's uh, work uh, uh, begins. Uh, why? Because against fiction, what you have is fabulation or what you call confabulation. Uh, uh, against fiction, you have something called confabulation, making stories, making legends. OK. So now, what is confabulation? Confabulation is when you make stories up. Confabulation is when, instead of producing a fiction that you want people to believe is the case, what you do, actually, you bring people 
you put the camera and you let them go into a delirium, which is very different. This was, the, this was done a lot by what you call minoritarian cinema and activist cinema, like uh, Perrault, Rouge, uh, and the like. What they used to do, you know, Perrault uh, works in Canada with little communities. Uh, Rouge works in Africa with African communities. And these are, of course, subject to the importation of culture, to fiction, and to these uh, images of themselves produced by others. I hope now you understood this uh, graph. Uh, what is a Vietnamese? You, you watch a movie from the States, you know what is a Vietnamese, and you don't have other images for that. Okay. So the idea is how do you resist this? Perrault and Rouge, and I think Walid Raad, what they do is they create fabulation. Fabulation is when you put a camera, and the people which are there, they start improvising and creating a delirious story. For example, Perrault, maybe you don't know Perrault, but I'll talk about him anyway. Uh, so Perrault is a Canadian movie maker. What he does is that he brings these Canadians from the, uh, these uh, excluded uh, areas, and he tells them, uh, I'm filming you, tell me uh, stories. And because he's filming them, they start uh, making up stories. Uh, and they start really like inventing stuff. Uh, so one of them uh, proposes to hunt the beluga, which is a kind of uh, forgotten white whale that lives in Canada, who's, and their ancestor used to do it. So they go into this delirium of let's go hunt the white whale again, and indeed they go hunt the white whale. And we are surprised at the end because indeed there is a white whale. Because, but, but whatever is the story, I hope you're getting how it works. So what Rouge does, he brings a camera, he brings young people from the encode favelas in Africa, very poor places in Africa, and he tells them to play something, and they start playing uh, Marlon Brando and stuff like that, and you see them really like playing Marlon Brando, James Dean, and uh, Lemmy Cautions and stuff like that. And you see these young kids like playing themselves as if they are uh, Hollywood stars. And here you really feel how you can like play with that. Now, these characters, these characters that you call in order to capture the delirium they have, these characters, like the young kids, etc., that you call in order to generate a delirium that you cannot really expect or script, this is what you call, these are what you call intercessors, intercessors or intercessors in English, meaning via them, you're able to capture the delirium which is there in the air in a region, but what, that wasn't captured in the fiction about the region. You see, I hope you're getting that. Uh, there's a delirium in the air, but how to capture it? If you watch the movie by Schlondorf, uh, uh, Circle of Decide, you don't get the delirium. You only see dead people or uh, violent people. You feel in the background that there's something crazy going on in the city, but you really don't get the way they joke, they speak, they, they have a delirium, okay? So the characters of Walid Raad, I think we can understand them as intercessors, meaning Walid Raad is going to create a character, be it Dr. Fakhouri or, uh, or uh, Trabulsi or, 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 all these characters that you have. And when he creates this character, with this character, he's able to create a delirious story about the Lebanese war that captures the delirium in the Lebanese wars. Did you get how he functions? You see, uh, what's the problem with the movie of uh, Nwairi, uh, you know, The Insult? You've seen that movie, The Insult? Okay, The Insult, there's a problem in this movie. It is a fiction. Yeah, he's Lebanese, you know, he, he used to work with Tarantino, uh, he, he's, he, uh, which is not bad, but what I'm saying is that he has this thing that for him a movie is a real movie, like an American movie. I think he, he wasn't able to resist that. And for him to make a movie about the war in Lebanon, you have to bring the Palestinian, the Christian. He huh? used to work with uh, the Yes. For, for it's a true story. He used to he used to be the I think assistant camera or assistant uh, director. So he he he's part of that school, 
And he, he knows how to make movies, you know, like montage, cuts, stuff like that, uh, directing actors. All of this is good. I'm not saying that it's not good. But there's a fundamental problem, politically speaking, on the form, which is that it's a fiction. Meaning he sat in his room, he imagined the Palestinians the way he imagines them. Usually, as he read it in the fictions that come from the newspaper, TF, uh, yeah. And he imagines the Christian guys the way he imagined them. And then he made this kind of confrontation, and, and it adds in, in a court and with the president. So you feel that something very, very uh, wrong in that, because uh, it's not what is happening on the ground here. So how to capture what is happening on the ground here? I hope you're getting the problematic. If you want to sit in your room and invent your character, wh wh what, are you, what are you going to repeat? You're going to repeat what you have seen on TF1, on TN2, CNN, what you read in the books which are uh, you know, spread all over the place. Uh, and after all, your fiction is going to be one more fiction that goes in line with that. So if you don't want to do that, you have to take your, my, your, your, uh, your recorder or your camera and bring people from the street and tell them, uh, you, you go into a delirium. Tell me you how you sing, how you tell the story, how do you uh, invent things. And this is when you're able to capture something which is there and which was repressed by the fictional strat. Okay? So this is why it's a political act not to do fiction here and to go into a confabulation and to make people go into a delirium. And, and for that, you, have, you need to have a talent. Huh? Yeah, because it's very, very complicated to put people at ease uh, and to let them go into a delirium. Okay. So I'm going to show you one of these works that invest into the, uh, into the, uh, fic into the fabulation of the Lebanese war. So this work is called Missing Lebanese Wars, it, it looks like that. Usually it's only this. And in here, Walid Rahad, as you can see, uh, it's, a paper, it's, a, it's a sheet from a notebook. And you have a clip from an Nahar newspaper with a horse race. I don't know if you remember this, but in, in Al Nahar, uh, I think on Monday or Sunday, you used to have, you used to put the winning horse. And then you have numbers indicating uh, the distance that the horse run, how in how much time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as you can see here, there is a very weird distance, which is uh, the the head of the horse to the arriving line. And actually, what's the story about that? The story about that, Walid Raad says, that Dr. Fakhouri, which is one of these intercessors, which is a historian, Dr. Fakhouri is a historian, and hence Dr. Fakhouri and his historian friends, which come from different uh, regions in Lebanon, they used to gather in the horse races on Sunday, and they used to bet not on which horse will win, but on how much the photographer is going to miss the horse when he's crossing the line. Is this clear, the story? So they bet actually on this, on the distance between the head of the horse and the arriving line. And if, and of course, the closest you bet, if you say it will be one centimeter, or uh, you win. If the other guy says two centimeters, he lose. Or you, you got how they bet? And this is why it's called missing Lebanese wars. Missing, meaning you want to get it right, but you are not able to get it right. Now, why is he saying that it's missing Lebanese wars? Because as you know, in a war, it's very difficult to capture the event when it's happening. Let's suppose there's a massacre or a bombardment. You can't capture it. You always miss it. You always uh, capture it afterwards or before. We can really capture the moment of the explosion or the moment of the massacre. So you're always missing Lebanese wars. So I hope now you see this uh, delirious construction. Dr. Fakhouri, uh, they betting on that. Now, there's on, not only that. So you have the distance here, and then you have a winning historian. Here, in this area here, you have the description of the winning historian. So each time a historian wins, Dr. Fakhouri in his notebook, he writes the way the historian looks. 
So this historian is like that. Her query is linguistic sloppiness, ambiguity, redundancy, modifiers, disappearing pronouns, mixed metaphors, and such. This is the winning historian. I read you descriptions of winning historians. So another, another winning historian is a potent shadow, a legend that has grown into an official sanctioned cult. So I hope you're getting how this artwork works. So you have the picture of the horse, the winning historian description, more data about the day, how much he ran, stuff like that. And then you read this description of the winning historian. So on the plate, for example, on plate number one, the winning historian is a potent shadow, a legend that has grown an officially uh, sanctioned cult. In plate number two, the winning historian is described like that. As far as women goes, he was essentially very shy. One feels that he was sexually terribly inhibited. This is the description of the winning historian, and so on and so forth. So what is he doing? Now, when you look at the Walid Rad work, do it. Each time you hear, each time you see a sentence, Google it. Okay? So if you Google the sentence, it takes you to the New York Times, the New York Times of 7-7-1987, and in the New York Times, you have this sentence. Actually, who is the winning historian? The winning historian is Atatürk. Because Atatürk is a potent shadow, a legend that has grown into an officially sanctioned cult, envelops every aspect of Turkish life. It is the shadow of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, founder of the Turkish Republic and a virtual deity here. The Atatürk cult has its cathedral, the museum in Ankara, where his body is, etc., etc. And the problem is that you can't really now make an image or conceive who is really Atatürk. Why you can't do that? Because he's so big and legendary that no one can really know anymore who he really was. And this is when uh, the article concludes. These restrictions together with a maze of social and political taboos have made it all but impossible for Turkish scholars to produce objective assessment of his life and work. Okay. So you see what he's doing now, Walid Ra. Walid Ra is telling the story about how you can't capture objectively or really the Lebanese war because you're always missing them. He makes an image of it with these races and the horses. In the races of the horses, now he starts creating a web of information or a web of counter-information where each historian refers to another situation where you cannot really capture objectively what you're talking about. Okay, this is, if you want, the work. Yeah. Uh, plagiarism, yeah, but you have to sue him. I don't know how to. It's not plagiarism. It's uh, it's okay. It's for the. It's okay if in this case. But yes, it is plagiarism. Yeah, you're right. He didn't quote that. He he took it from New York Times, uh, and uh, it's true. So, so if you want, this is another one. This is Mr. This is. Play two is also about Atatürk. Uh, the guy who is sexually inhibited is also about Atatürk. Uh, Play four is about Mr. Kim. Uh, Mr. Kim, he's described as a somber man with a, with a thickening middle, but a full head of jet black hair. Okay, so who is Mr. Kim? Mr. Kim is a guy who was, uh, who was assassinated or who died and it was impossible to really know how he was dead. Okay, so you're getting again this kind of impossibility. So I'll read you one more. Uh, so this, this is Dr. Mahatir. Uh, and Dr. Mahatir, I'll read you Sayyid Mikbel. Yeah, okay, I'll read you Sayyid Mikbel, which is plate number eight. So Sayyid Mikbel, this is from New York Times in 79. Uh, no, this is, no, the plate is dated 79, but the New York Times is 94, sorry. So Sayyid Mikbel, who was killed by Islamist fundamentals on December the 3rd, 1994. The article deals with the difficulties of the interaction between the military and the journalists. The journalists should be monitored, wars uh, covered in a limited way, in order not to generate consequences that could affect the course of the operations. Now, this is, if you want, the summary of the article. 
The article goes like that. This thief who at night hugs the walls as he walks home is him. This father who recommends to his children never to mention his profession is him. This vagabond who does not know whether to spend the night is him. This man who swears he will not die with his throat cut is him. He is all these things and he is only a journalist. The bizarre situation thus created in Bosnia is that journalist access to information stands in inverse proportion to the volume of sophisticated gear they carry around to communicate what they know. The very possibility of instantaneous and worldwide transmission, it seems, has made the facts that much more politically explosive and so that much more necessary to conceal. Okay, so I explained. Is the idea clear? So he's, he's referring to this guy, which is uh, Sayyid Mikbel, who was uh, actually killed by Islamists. And he's saying that the problem when you have very sophisticated journalistic gears, like cameras and internet connection and stuff like that, is that the photos you take can contribute to the course of the events. You've seen that a little bit in the movie by Schlondorf. Uh, actually, fighters in Lebanon, and this is true, they used to kill in order to be taken into for in by the photojournalists. And once the photojournalists used to publish how they killed, let's say, the Christian kills the Palestinian or vice versa, the counter attack used to come on the ground of the photos and what, what, what has been said. And here you see now how this kind of photojournalism is not only fiction, it is real. It is real in the sense that it really contributes to the mess which is there. And this is why in the article, uh, they are saying that the military in Bosnia are trying to control the photojournalists, not to take photos or to broadcast them, not only because they are against the truth, but because their photos can contribute to more massacres. Okay. So this is another situation where photography begins to interfere with reality and the unfolding of uh, reality. Now, there's a last plate I want to talk to you about. All the plates are reference, and each, in each plate you have a situation where you have an event that cannot be covered, or you can't read the objectivity of the event, or something of this kind. Now, what's interesting is, in the last plate, plate MLWV72, uh, the winning historian is this one. What mattered to him above all was to avoid, avoid anything that might be remin rem reminiscent of empathy. Okay? This is a winning historian. Now, if you Google that, actually, the sentence in the winning story was, what mattered to her, if you just change her to him, actually, this quote is taken from Hannah Arendt describing Benjamin. This is why he replaced the him with the her. And Hannah Arendt describes Benjamin, and this is when you understand what Walid Rad is doing because he's quoting what he's doing. So what is he doing, uh, Walid Rad, if you want to know what he's doing? You know, uh, Benjamin had a project to make a book just with quotes, uh, and uh, only with quotes, meaning he doesn't write anything, he just takes quotes, and by arranging the quotes, you're able to read through and understand something uh, with a pure quotes. So this is what Benjamin says. From the Goethe essay on, Quotations are at the center of every work of Benjamin's. This very fact distinguishes his writing from scholarly works of all kinds in which it is the function of quotations to verify and document opinions, wherefore they can safely be relegated to the notes. This is out of the question in Benjamin. When he was working on his study of German tragedy, he boasted of a collection of over 600 quotations very systematically and clearly arranged. Like the later notebooks, this collection was not an accumulation of experts intended to facilitate the writing of the study, but constituted the main work with the writing as something secondary. So I hope this is clear. Now, so what is he, uh, you know, this approach by Benjamin, what do you do? You have all of these documents, all of these quotes, images, stuff like that, 
And what you do is that you drill through. You, you like a word, like an information word, you drill through and you create connections. And actually by following the connections, this is how you get the statement or, or what is uh, going on. This is why uh, uh, Hannah Arendt continues, she says, to plumb the depths of language and thought by drilling rather than excavating, so as not to ruin everything with explanations that seek to provide a causal or systematic connection. Okay? So I think that really this is what uh, Walid uh, Rad is doing. He's drilling. And instead of explaining things, like the Lebanese words were like that, and uh, stuff are like this, so what he does is that he puts you all of these documents. Uh, if you are curious or uh, you know, motivated enough, you start drilling, and actually you start seeing an article here, an article there. And this is how he is able to take you in this kind of hypertext, which is the internet, via his little work of art, which is this page with the name of the historian, and the, uh, uh, you know, this little delirious story. And this puts you in this bubble of information. Yeah. It's just clear for everyone, okay? I hope you see now how you create a counter information. So what Walid Raad is doing via Dr. Fakhouri in this case, he's creating a character. This character is having a delirium on the Lebanese walls. And this delirium on the Lebanese walls is inbranching into a web of connected other situations at the Turk, Bosnia, there's, a, there's one on London, on the States. The whole world is now connected to this fact of missing a Lebanese war. Is this clear? Yeah. Okay. So I hope you got this first one. The first one, this is what you can call the, uh, a kind of condensation point. Uh, it's a condensation point. It's a condensation point from which you can really like bring in a whole range of information centered in one uh, point. Now, who, who have seen the talks? Yeah, you've seen the talks. OK, so I hope now this is talking to you too. Uh, so you've seen the talk on uh, the, the American, uh, the, the immigrants in the US that get captured. You, with, the, with his bag being open at the airport, you've seen that? I've seen the other one. Huh? I've seen the other one. There's one on, on, the, on the car bombing in yeah. bag, and there's another one on, in the, US, like in the US, Sweden, and many countries, they're capturing uh, usually Muslim guys because they're suspected to be terrorists. Did you see the other one too? Uh, yeah. yeah. Huh? The Ashkel Alwan one. Great. So you see, what is he doing in these works? Uh, really, it's a very, like, uh, what is he doing in these works? Uh, I read you a quote. Uh, I read you a quote because we could think that he's denouncing, but I don't think that he's denouncing. Uh, we could think that he's reconstituting the furniture back car explosion, but maybe he's doing something else. Uh, this is what I want to underline to finish. So, so Walid Raad says, okay, when you connect all these dots, what's the use of it? Uh, anyone? No? So I read you, the, I read you this. Um, so this is from... This is when he said, this is on the war on terror. I feel a great desire to meet the masses once again. Uh, and this is what Walid Raad says on that. Over the past two years, several times I hoped that the task of gathering this material and assembling these stories would have been more difficult. I always said, this is too easy. I kept thinking to myself, a few billion dollars spent on intelligence so that an artist with an internet connection and some free time can uncover all this. This can't be. The political artist tasked to revealing scandals hidden within the spheres of a global conspiracies proved to be obsolete and irrelevant. 
everything was already there before our eyes, no need to add visibility to what is already visible. This is really his conclusion of the work on the, uh, uh, on the uh, Islamic guys who are being, on the Muslim guys who are being arrested. I said all of this seems to be utterly useless. So when you do your graph and you connect all these dots, some people think that it is in order to really like bring the truth to the world. Walid Raad, he's saying, I'm not trying to bring the truth to the world. So what is he doing? Uh, anyone know? You see, what is he doing in this case? In this case, I think what he is really doing, he is trying to explore a dimension of delirium. Uh, what he calls hysteric symptoms sometimes, what he calls uh, collective, uh, collective projections or memories, what he's trying to do is, is this. If you are now dealing with the situation of being a Muslim in America and being suspected of being a terrorist, this situation of you being an immigrant in America, Muslim, uh, you know, dark hair and stuff like that, you are fulfilling the stereotype Around you, you will have a whole web of connections which are simply triggered by the paranoia of the administration, and it is this paranoia that starts doing these connections. His job is to reveal this paranoid atmosphere or dimension in which uh, this subject is taken. I hope this is clear. So his job is not to reveal the truth, but actually when you're watching that, your own stereotypes, projections, fears, what you have seen on TV here and there gets activated and you start associating all of these ideas the way he's associating them on the screen. Actually, Walid Raad, in order to write his scripts, what he does is not only research, what he does is something else. He starts he has an interior monologue, like, okay, let's suppose I'm a Muslim. What is the first thing I think about? I think about, okay, uh, if I'm going to the airport, they will arrest me. Yeah, it's very plausible. So you see, he's really like inhabiting this realm. The in the US. If, I, if I'm crossing the borders in the US, they will arrest me because I'm Walid Rad, uh, coming from Lebanon, you know. Uh, so I have this profile that I can be screened as a potential terrorist. And then he starts, uh, you know, uh, brooding on it. So if I have in my pocket, I don't know, a lighter or a, or a knife or an image of a car explosion, what would they think about? And this is how he builds his delirious uh, scenario. So you see, I, th I think that when you go there, you're already in a form of confabulation. Uh, what does it mean is that you relate to yourself as a delirious subject. You relate to yourself, not anymore as the rational Walid Rad who teaches in universities and stuff like that, no. You relate to yourself and to your mental capacities as if now you are observing where your mind is going and roaming around. And when you let your mind go and roam around, this is when you start building your fiction, which is not in this case a fiction, it's a confabulation. So I hope you get the difference between I let my mind roam around in order to see how the paranoid structure see me and how I will react to that and how this is different from I'm going to sit here on my desk and try to describe what would an Arab look like really. Meaning truthfully, be it not like the fiction, like the reality. You see, in both cases, you're caught in the game of the fiction reality. And I think the only way to get out of that is to mobilize the faculty of making up stories, meaning of confabulating. And this is how you're able to cut through that or pass through the fiction reality uh, couple. Right? So I repeat, you see, you can very well to write your scenario, sit on a table and relate to yourself as a rational being. Who am I really? And you write who you are really. Like I'm a professor, I do this, I do that. I'm not the fictions that they are projecting on me. But even here you miss, you miss the, uh, 
configuration of the image or what is at play in the image because you as an image you are you are or one of your function is to face the way you are imaged in the fiction and this is where confabulation comes in okay so he did it uh, three times so you have one on the uh, Lebanese wars with the explosions of furnished ship back of course this is not a factual assessment of what happened he really plays on your projections. Like Jaja was here, he called the uh, Hbaya, and they brought the car, they got arrested, and you have these phone calls and diagrams and all of this. That, all of this puts you in this atmosphere of the war. If you have wars, the one uh, that you have here, uh, here you have a version in Arabic from Ashkal Alwan, and you see the guy reading is actually Bilal Khbez, and he's reading, and his tone is like the news, uh, the, the TV news, and it puts you in this atmosphere of the war when you used to listen to the news, and all of this creates your, you know, your delirium or your projections on the uh, explosions. On the other hand, you have also the, the pension, uh, art pension fund. I've sent you the text. I hope you will read it. The text, you have it. I don't have the talk. And in the Art Pension Fund, again, you have the same story again. Walid Rad is sitting there, he's doing his work, he receives a call from an insurance company, and he discovers that this insurance company is related to Israel and is related to the intelligence services, and then he unpacks the whole grid, and then at the end he tells you, yeah, but what's the use of unpacking this whole grid? Maybe there's something else. So I, know how, uh, how, I hope now you're getting the pattern. He unpacks the whole grid, and then he concludes all the time that this is too banal, it's too easy. What do you want me to do with that? Why? Because what he's doing is not on the level of objective truth. Okay? It's clear for everyone. Yeah. Now, with this in mind, I hope we, you will uh, interact differently with that. Uh, So the Art Pension Fund uh, So this is how he concludes on the Art Pension Fund He says He says here after constructing the whole grid Yes, I say to myself, this is intelligent. I would even say this is very intelligent, but at the end of the day, it is also too familiar. It's banal, it is expected, and I, for one, don't find any of it in situ. I don't even find it interesting, certainly not interesting enough to deserve an artwork. After all, do we really need another artwork to show us as if we don't already know that the cultural, financial, and military spheres are intimately linked. No, we don't. This may be intelligent, but it is not insidious, and it is certainly undeserving of more of my words. Okay? So after building the whole grid, actually the grid which is here, uh, he built you all the connections between the intelligence, the, the Israeli intelligence, the company in the US, how they track images, how they ensure artists, and how they get his artwork and the thing. He tells you this is too intelligent and not really interesting. But what is interesting in the story is this movement that you do in this realm of the imaginary or the imaginary, or the imaginary realm. So let's watch a bit of that. This way it gives you a concrete grasp on it. For those who didn't watch, I advise you to go to the site of Ashkar Elwan. It's a very valuable site because you have everything and everyone you talk about uh, live. in Amman, Jordan, in the 1970s. We all... One day, I left Beirut. I can say that I left Beirut many times before. 
We lived in Freetown, in Sierra Leone, for a year in 1968. I visited my grandparents in Amman, in Jordan, in the 1970s. We also traveled to Eastern and Western Europe by car in the 1970s. But I wanted to remember the day I went to the United States, the day I left, as we refer to it today. I remember leaving by boat. I remember the shelling on that gray day as my parents quickly said goodbye. I remember taking photographs as I left. Clearly, others were photographing their departure as well. I remember arriving in Cyprus and producing this picture, pleased with what my newly acquired special effect filter was producing. I also remember wandering around in Paris, trying to find the American consulate. I also remember my first night in New York, in a cheap motel room after I had missed my connecting flight to Boston, my final destination where my brother, where my brother was waiting for me. I recently saw the date in question in my passport from that time, page 9, September 18, 1983, more than 20 years ago. I was 14 years old. This was about a year and a half after the Israeli invasion of Lebanon and the deterioration of the political and security situation once again. But this time, the local militias, the Lebanese forces, were recruiting, were forcing young men to fight, to serve. The Lebanese forces controlled East Beirut, where I grew up. They were allies of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982, an invasion that I occasionally watched and I occasionally photographed from a parking lot in front of my mother's house. The Israelis were shelling West Beirut a few hundred meters away. In East Beirut, we watched and we listened. I watched, I photographed F-16 planes swoop over the city I watched them drop their bombs on Beirut, time, and again, and again, and yet again. There was even a day when I decided, for some reason that remains unclear today even, to go to the hills overlooking Beirut where the Israeli army was stationed. I wanted to photograph them, and they did not seem to mind. Their weapons were loaded and around. I was surprised that I was allowed to walk freely and this close to these young men. I don't remember thinking that I should grab one of the guns and to start shooting. I'm not sure I am capable of this even today. At 14, I clearly did not know what I was doing. At 14, I only knew that I liked to take pictures. Pictures of apples, pictures of flowers, pictures of basketball games, and of my good friends, Fadi and Jihad. Last December, about a year ago, I was not allowed to fly from Rochester, New York, to New York City. Earlier that day, I had dropped off my family at the airport. I proceeded to return the rental car we had rented for the weekend and headed to JetBlue's counter where I checked in. After the usual questions, do you have any firearms to declare? Do you, do you pack your own bags? I was allowed to join Lynn, my wife, and Petra, our daughter, at the gate. Minutes later, Officer Rick Schuberlein, Monroe County's deputy sheriff, approached me, and he asked me to come with him. He said, we found some suspicious items in your luggage, and we want to ask you some questions. My initial reaction 
as well as my wife's, confirmed to us that we have been expecting this for a while, for the past three years, I suppose. The officer accompanied me to the sheriff's office, which was located in the ground floor of the airport. And as we were walking there, the officer would ask me questions about what I do, where I come from. I refused to answer his question, informing him that I will only speak to his supervisor. I do not wish to repeat myself. I do not wish you to misquote what I say, I told the baby-faced 20-year-old. Once inside the office, I was introduced to Sergeant Matt McGrath, who was going through the luggage I had checked in earlier at the JetBlue counter. I was asked to sit down, to face the sergeant, and to wait. I sat, and I waited. Nothing happened. No questions. About a minute later, a beefy man in his 30s, with a shaved head, dressed in civilian clothes, a tan Carhartt jacket, enters the room. He extends his hands, and he identifies himself as Pat Ponticello of the Federal Bureau of Investigations, the FBI. He then shows me his badge. I look at the badge carefully, as if I knew what a real FBI badge is supposed to look like. He sits down, pulls his chair behind a small table on which several items from my suitcase are now placed in front of him. He asks about my name, my nationality, my profession, my marital status. And then he looks at the items in front of him. First, there were some portrait photographs, six portrait photographs of me in costume, clearly younger, with hair, against blue, red, white, and dark backgrounds in different shirts, different hairstyles. Can I explain these, asked the agent. Self-portraits, I said. I produced them in 1985, within a year of arriving to the United States. I'm an artist, I'm a photographer, I explained. Agent Ponticello seemed a bit confused. Okay, so I... I hope you see how he uses the indexical. So each time he says something, he shows you something. Like, this is me, this is my bag, this is what I took. But I see, you see how he uses the indexical in order to open on a delirium. I think this is really like the formal critique. Where well, usually you use the indexical just to maintain the fiction and reality uh, consolidation. He uses it in order for you to create, to create effects of beliefs. Yeah, this is true. But when you connect all of these effects of belief, you start going into a total delirium of, in this case, the paranoia of the American administration, or the delirium of the Lebanese wars, or the delirium of the artist, uh, uh, the artist communities, like with the art, uh, the art, uh, the pension art fund, or depending on the delirium of a group, is able to like make you live and access this dimension of the delirium uh, via these indexical points that he puts on his screen. And then you have a whole web and you are there and you live this kind of uh, thing. I think this is what he's really after in these performances. I'm not re-establishing the truth or denouncing because anyway, this, he, he like tells you this is useless. It's useless to go and denounce uh, the CIA uh, Okay, so I hope this is clear. So next time we will see the exposition of the works of the Atlas Group. Uh, I hope you read the readings uh, till then. Okay.